Okay, so um, maybe we should get going. So thank you everybody for coming to uh, the uh, Deco, Miko, DSSS, um, uh, whatever that um, series should be called. Um, I'm very happy to have this chance to actually um, talk to you guys about, um, show you some of the work that we've done since, um, actually this is intended to show a little bit um, the work that we've done since moving here to Tübingen. Um, not least because this year we have a um, good number of um, groups and departments starting. And so, um, you know, it would be nice to, um, to you know, um, uh, by way of a little bit of introduction, show the different kinds of things we do. Okay, so I'll um, get started. Um, people can see the screen fine? Yeah, good, yeah, all right, excellent. Yeah, so. Like many of you, I'm interested in evolution. Specifically, I'm interested in understanding both the how the genome works, as in how the A's, T's, and G's in the genome come together to encode for life, but also how the genome changes to give rise to this kind of amazing diversity that we see here. Let me get a pointer. For many of us, um, the story of evolution really started with Darwin's finches. And so I'll take a cue from Nick Grishin, for example, to start with the time travel. Here, I want to highlight um, several key insights from Darwin's uh, own journey towards the discovery of evolutionary theory, which I think can inform us about how to think about studying change through time. So Darwin went on a vo voyage of the Beagle to collect the finches from the different islands in the Galapagos. Like us, as much as Darwin could travel the world, he could not travel out of his own time to observe evolution as it happens. So how did he make this seminal discovery about this inherently dynamic process that unfolds over a long period of time? One of Darwin's insight was the comparison across lineages. These finches collected from different islands show the results of adaptation and reveal the hands of selection to Darwin. This allows him A, to see the differences that normally would take a long time to accrue, and B, selection has already done the work for him to identify many of the meaningful differences. So, Importantly, in this, um, in, in this example here, if he were to just look at a single lineage, for example, there may not be many meaningful noticeable differences because meaningful changes are going to be fixed within a lineage and therefore the differences he's not going to catch. He has to do it by comparing across these, um, these, um, these populations. He, Darwin has also conducted extensive breeding experiments, famously with pigeons among many others. He was therefore able to see for himself how selection can shape the organisms and the breeders can actually change the pigeon's phenotype um, or, in, um, or change the genome um, in today's understanding. So importantly, he has paid special attention to hybrids between anim animals and plants and considered how impeding of the gene flow or character can be deeply revealing. This is so central to the evolutionary theory that Darwin devoted a whole chapter of the origin of species to discuss this topic. And then he applies his power of imagination to integrate the dynamics. And in doing so, supply the time component that is missing that we cannot you know, like circumvent in that, in that case. And so most, most importantly, you need to collect you know, lots and lots of data from in this case, you know, to, in order to be able to make these inferences. So I'll argue here that these themes are actually still very um, re relevant today. And this in, in my mind is how you should study the genetics of evolutionary change. We do it not necessarily because you know, it's an easy topic to study. We're doing it because this research question really matters in that it tells you about you know, important dynamics about how evolution actually works. And you can't do it by only just doing gene knockout studies or by mapping QTLs or doing GWAS in a particular given population. You really need to do this comparison across lineages. You need to catch evolution, so to speak, as it happens, or just after the fact like Darwin did. So in fact, you know, I would argue that by studying these kind of dynamic and unique systems, we can find out about the genes and genetic variants that selection acts on, and that is what really you know, drives evolution. So today I'll illustrate our work by drawing on examples from um, our, our, across a range of topics. The through line here um, from the island mice and selection experiment is how we look at this question both broadly, but also deeply in order to understand the molecular and genetic basis of evolutionary change. Our first topic also starts on an island. In our case, it deals with island giganism and the origin of, very of a peculiar population of mice. 
It turns out that there has been a, an ecological rule um, called fossils rule or simply the island rule where animals on remote islands tend to converge to a medium size. So in other words, you know, small animals tend to become bigger and larger animals tend to become um, smaller, like, you know, um, examples of hippo elephants or, you know, so-called hobbits, you know, on the Flores Islands in Indonesia, for example. So in this case, for mice on remote islands, this becomes effectively a natural experiment with islands effectively serving as uh, petri dishes. Of all these islands, some of them, like those in the Faroe Islands here in Northern Atlantic, were reported to be among um, the largest mice in the world. So I was interested in this because I want to understand the process of parallel evolution. In particular, in comparing um, the kind of genes that were involved in um, examples of gigantism in the lab under artificial selection versus those in the wild. So we picked the Faroe Islands for an in-depth study. Um, when they were discovered a little bit more than 100 years ago, um, these mice were so distinct that they were actually described as a subspecies. Um, it was uh, remarked that they were uh, remarkable for the great size. In these, they are, um, they are veritable giants being considerably larger than the type and of any of these numerous um, geographical races. They also feature more robust rostrum and perhaps more depressed brain cases. In particular, back in those early days, taxonomists really liked to use morphological features to describe, um, to define species. So they keyed into a specific feature called the mesoteric fossil here um, on the bottom of the skull and decided that the Faroese mouse actually um, looks quite distinct, but also they look like um, the um, share the same feature as the St. Kilda mouse from the Scottish Outer Hebrides Island, leading to the hypothesis that these mice were actually related. But despite this hypothesis, um, work from Jeremy Searle and ourselves um, have shown using both um, mitochondrial but also nuclear markers that in fact, you know, like there was not a lot of um, um, related, um, these two populations are not related at all. Um, so to study this, I mounted a, an expedition in 2009 um, at the beginning of my postdoc back then to collect the mice in order to make these um, make crosses. So this is what a cross may, you know, look like. So in this case, we crossed that against a, a small um, lab strain. And then, you know, effectively by breeding uh, for um, two generations, we reshuffle the genome. And then you can start tracking the co segregation of traits with the underlying genotype and uh, using genetic markers. Um, and um, then you will be able to actually start uh, mapping particular traits. And if you're lucky, you might even be able to find map and find specific variants that may explain the trait. And in cases, you know, maybe uh, even down to individual mutations. So we, we did that study and to cut a long story short, we found that among other things um, that there were a predominantly polygenic genetic architecture controlling body weight. Um, we were able to find a good number of genes, in fact, more than hundred QDLs. Um, and, but there was actually very little evidence, both by comparison, comparing against lab strains, but also against other examples of island gigantism, that there was a lot of uh, reuse of exactly the same gene uh, in this case for you know, increased body size. But another thing that we can also look at uh, was morphology to understand the distinctiveness of the Faroese mice. To do that, we use MicroCT, which uses X-ray for 3D reconstructions of entire bone volumes. In total, we obtained scans for uh, whole skeletons in about 680 animals. And if you know anything about morphometrics and landmarking, you know that um, this is actually a gigantuan data set that would take you know, people years you know, like, uh, to landmark if you were to do it in a more traditional way. So we built a pipeline to speed this up and with enough precision to allow for genetic mapping. Much of the latter part of this pipeline actually was the work of um, Alec Husseinov as posted out in my lab. The first step in this case is to isolate or segment the bones and then to label each accordingly. Importantly, you know, like the computer in this case, you know, really is just looking at grayscale and looking at data. So it has no idea. So in that, effectively, we have to show the computer what the bones are and by labeling in this case, you know, very carefully a reference sample. And then we use an image alignment approach or registration to port these seeds, you know, like the labels, which is then grown in a focal sample. This creates a highly accurate map in each focal animal, uh, which then allows us to computationally take apart the skeleton. So like with the skull, you can take away the mandibles. And you know, the nice thing about this pipeline is that it takes only about eight minutes to run per mouse. And um, it has a really high resolution at about 40 microns, so almost a cellular resolution. We can then perform genetic mapping using the extractive features. Next step of the pipeline is to compare shapes. 
To do that, we combine image analysis approaches and also geometric morphometric approaches. First, we align or register the image on top of um, each other. Then we drape the mesh over the sample. Uh, the nice thing about mesh shape is that, you know, we can mathematically describe and deform each one of these uh, shape to match each other. So in doing so, we can mathematically transform uh, a, um, a sample mesh against a reference um, with a common set of landmarks. At which point we can align these sets of landmarks using 3D um, commonly called Procrustes alignment methods to study how the focal samples change uh, with the genetic background. So the result is a very dense set of, um, of landmarks that describe very nicely each individual skull with really high resolution. Um, we have done actually uh, repeatability and accuracy um, studies on this compared to, let's say, you know, like manual landmarking approaches by experts like myself and others. And uh, we can show that this computer algorithm does by far a better job in a fraction of the time. So at this point, we're ready to correlate these phenotypes with the underlying genetic changes. And one good way to summarize this is um, uh, to do a principal components um, analysis or PCA, which is effectively looking at some of the main ways the, um, the um, way the shape of the skull you know, can be changing across uh, individuals in this cross. Shown here on the left, are some, some, of, some of the summaries of um, how much the main principal components or PCs you know, would be um, varying along, this, um, along each one of those um, axes. Um, among the skulls. So for example, here, this is the back of the skull, you know, being loaded very heavily for PC2 and here uh, in the snout region at the tip. We can then find genetic association across the genome with these changes and make um, these lot plots, which summarizes the statistical support for um, the presence of a mutation, you know, like uh, in, a, in a given location for the trait in question. So, you know, if it goes high, it means high statistical support. And with this line, it indicates the genome-wide significance threshold. So what you can see is that we find a number of strong association of this trait across uh, much of the genome. And um, um, across much of, much of the genome. And so, um, and I want to draw your attention in particular to this peak on chromosome four here. Um, so um, if you zoom into this, um, it shows that actually um, this particular PC affects the um, zygomatic arches and also, you know, like um, some of the landmarks on the bottom of this curve. And if you look at the peak region very nicely, you see there's actually an r spontin 2 gene, which um, is um, um, an activator for the canonical um, wind signaling pathway. And um, famously, this r spontin 2 gene is known for um, actually uh, causing limb deformation. So if you were to knock out the gene, you know, like um, the animals will lose all its uh, limbs. But otherwise, it wasn't particularly well known for actually controlling um, the trait of the skull. And so in this case, if you were to now, now look at the movie um, that shows the morph of um, the changes in the, um, in the structure, what you see is that, you know, like the psychomatic arches are actually um, being mostly changed, you know, by this PC4. If you look at the left extreme of the trait, um, of the trait distribution, you will see that actually mice carrying two copies of the, um, of the um, lab strain or so-called S. Um, I'm having some Zoom problems here. Um, let me hide my Zoom screen so that I can see my own screen. Um, right, so on the left here, you can see that um, you will have um, the lab strains, you know, showing more of a lab a mouse phenotype. And on the right, you would then see, you know, like uh, the recapitulation of the Faroese haplotype uh, among mice that mostly actually carrying two copies of the Faroese allele. Okay, so, and if um, RSPO2 itself is docked out, it also shows um, some rather subtle uh, phenotype in um, the inability to form the uh, hard palate here um, as revealed by the cartilage Alcyon blue staining. So the problem though in this case is that actually the RSPO2 knockout, double knockout is lethal um, around birth. And so, you know, you cannot actually look at adult phenotypes. And so in order to do this, um, we have to ask for um, getting some of these um, mutants, mouse. Um, in this case, the mutant happens to be called um, footless. Um, and um, then we look at um, the heterozygous genotypes along with, this, um, with their litimates. And when you do a scan, what you see here is that um, the wild type litimates actually resemble the lab mouse phenotype. And then there was a narrowing of this um, mesoterigoid fossa um, as indicated by um, in the um, head. 
So here I want to remind you um, that we talked about this encoder mouse and also this morphological feature that seems to be shared um, between the Faroese mouse and the encoder mice. And so an obvious question in this case is, you know, like what might be happening in this region? Now, this mouse happens to be actually uh, extinct um, uh, on the island in 1926, um, very soon after people actually have moved out of the island, uh, moved off the island. And so we had to go to some uh, museum sample uh, from Jeremy Searle, and we were able to um, then uh, compare the genome in the genetic neighborhood, in this case, the topological associated domain or TAD uh, around OSBO2. And what you want to see is that um, if there is allele sharing between um, the St. Kilda mouse and the Faroese mouse, then you will have a dip in the pairwise genetic distance, like in this case here. And nicely, in this same region, you, will you should also expect to have actually a peak of divergence. Um, so, you know, like a, a longer genetic distance with the lab strain, indicating that in this case, there may be a haplotype sharing between um, the Faroese and um, the St. Kilda mouse um, in this structure. Now, this structure itself is actually not much of a morphological um, bone structure, but rather, in fact, you know, it is, um, it is um, more um, the area for passage of airway. So we think that one of the things that might be happening here is that evolution may actually be acting on um, temperature regulation, for example, rather than directly on the, hap on the hard palate uh, on the structure itself. So what I've shown you in this first section is that um, by studying um, the genetic example of island um, adaptation, that uh, we have um, done a study on looking at the genetic architecture of the evolved body size differences. And this is actually mostly due to the collective action of many genes, very polygenic um, and mostly independent in, this case, in that case. We've also um, then used um, applied morphometric approaches to study actually this skull trait um, and we're able to uh, trace it to uh, one of these particular um, bone features to uh, RSPO2 gene on chromosome 15 um, that can be traced all the way back to uh, the morphological character that was described about uh, 100 years ago. And in fact, you know, even though the Faroese mouse and St. Kilda mice largely do not share, share any uh, genetic uh, connection, in fact, at this particular region, we are finding some example and some evidence that perhaps they're sharing the same haplotype and therefore explaining uh, why, you know, they may be sharing this uh, very peculiar morphological feature. Okay, so in this first section, how are we doing on time? Um, right, um, I've shown you a little bit about you know, some of this comparison between derived forms um, that have none nonetheless um, um, undergone adaptation. And in fact, you know, like um, the study of island mice is still very much uh, a very active theme in our group. Uh, we are working with a number of people to also look at um, you know, um, different examples of chromosome um, fusions. This is so called ribosome, ribosomian fusions, but also you know, like uh, look at island mice in other examples to look at. Um, um, immunology, and in some cases also, you know, some uh, our collaborators are interested in microbiome. Okay, so in the next session, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, selection experiments um, in the context of long shanks mice. And this is um, a very nice set of kind of um, um, attempt to really try to capture evolution in action in that sense. And it features a lot of the main features uh, that we think about, you know, in terms of um, selection and evolution. Um, and um, with some of the main motiv motivating question, really, you know, how does the genome work? So you can think of describing the genome as a gene network with each one of these dots, you know, representing one gene. And, you know, like the overall shape, for example, of this graph, you know, could describe, let's say, you know, the phenotype. But, you know, we also know that actually the genome is not static. And so in that sense, you know, like the question of how does genome work also amounts under a selection regime, you know, to how the genome can change. And relevant questions for those kind of things would be, you know, how many genes uh, are we dealing with standing genetic variants versus de novo mutations? Or, um, and in this case, you know, like what genes actually um, uh, um, are relevant and what genes matter in this context, right? You know, like, are we talking about classical developmental regulated genes? Or are we talking about, you know, entirely surprising novel genes that nobody has ever heard about? And in this case, you know, if you're changing a gene network, you know, we're we talking about, you know, coding versus, you know, changing gene regulation. And in terms of, you know, like the mutation effect sizes, you know, are we dealing with large or small effects? So these are all kinds of very relevant questions that we can ask, you know, when you're trying to track an actual um, selection that is happening. And so in this case, I approached a colleague of mine, Campbell Rodian at the University of Calgary, 
And uh, here's this very nice uh, mouse model. This polygenic mouse model has um, created um, called Longshanks mice um, because he was interested in looking at the growth plate dynamics um, in the tibia and also how having longer legs you know, may affect you know, changes in, let's say, the gait of these mice. So the selection experiment itself is actually quite simple and elegant, but very powerful. So um, Campbell took outbred mice, uh, which shows variation in tibia length. And then, you know, just like it's a, you know, struggle for survival in a sense, you know, like he took the mice with the longest tibia and bred them with each other, leading to, you know, the next generation. And he simply then repeated this process over 19 generations. And what you see is um, the select selection response like this. So in the past 19 seconds of your life, um, represent basically the hard work of Campbell over five years of his time. And what you see here is actually a very classical and very strong, fast, rapid selection response of, um, that is highly significant, you know, like um, reaching over 5.3 standard deviations to the point where actually if you take a mouse from the last generation here, generation 20, the tibia length will be longer than the tibia, um, than, than the, mouse with the longest tibia um, in the founding um, uh, generation. So this is a really drastic increase in tibia length by 12%. And you can see here two you know, millimeters or so in the tibia. And uh, to put this in context, if it were a person with the corresponding changes in leg length and also in arm bone length you know, in human, a long shanks human would look something like this. And here we've got two problems. You know, one, the clothes don't fit anymore if you were to take the same clothes over. And two, I'm not even 180 centimeters tall and I could really use this 12 centimeters myself, although I'm on Zoom, you probably don't know any of that anyway, right? Okay, so the nice thing about this um, long chain selection experiment, um, and the reason why I actually really uh, was keen to um, collaborate with Campbell was because uh, when we talked, when we started talking about this, um, this experiment, he told me that he actually has all these mice in the freezer. So in that sense, you know, this is about as close to a complete perfect experiment as you can get, where you have the complete phenotype through the process and you have the pedigree relationship. And in fact, you can go back in and actually now sequence the mice and genome to figure out what exactly is going on. On top of it, the very nice thing about this is that in fact, he hasn't just done this experiment once, but rather he's done it three different times. So he's actually done a parallel selection replicate experiment with correspondingly large increase in trait but he has also done a control experiment where um, the mice themselves were randomly chosen to be, um, to be breeders. So in this case, you can see that there's actually no change um, in uh, no increase in TB length over time. And so this is actually an, an enormous um, experiment. And um, so we decided to actually go in and sequence, you know, like um, the breeders, um, which amounts to about um, 2000 mice uh, and track how the genome changes uh, re in response to selection. So one way, there are many different ways of looking at this, but one way that we used was um, to compare changes, shifts in allele frequency um, from the original founder generation over time. And uh, because there are two replicates, so we can actually make a comparison. And so uh, if uh, a dot, a 10 KB window moves along the, um, along the axis, it indicates that there are independent changes in, um, in um, independent selection response in each selection line. And if it moves along the diagonal, that indicates that this is a parallel change. And along the same time, we also uh, make a comparison against the control line here on the left. And I would also like to point out that this is actually, uh, you know, we receive huge amount of work and, uh, and, and support, um, both on the theory side, but also on modeling from Nick Barton. And we're very um, pleased about this collaboration. And so right here, what you're seeing then effectively is um, a time lapse of the selection experiment with many, many windows, each one of these start rep, uh, indicating a 10 KB window. And you can see how the gene frequency changes across the genome over 20 generations. Now there's several points to mention here. Um, you recall that actually the phenotypic response is really rapid and really fast, right? Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you just look hard here on the left side, um, in a comparison between the control line and line one, Turns out, you know, like um, under very polygenic response, in fact, you know, for the most part, you'll be hard pressed to tell the difference between um, the selection response overall from um, a line that has been, has undergone selection and a line that actually have evolved completely neutrally in this case. Um, in fact, there are only very few loci here. These are hitchhiking loci clusters that um, would have been dragged out. 
And luckily, because we have two selection lines here between line one and line two, we can actually now then see that there are also a number of loci that are changing uh, and increasing in frequency in parallel. So now let's take a look, close look at one of these loci. This is one of the uh, strongest responding loci um, in all of the genome and see how it changes over 20 generations. Yeah, so this particular window actually moves quite fast. And in fact, you know, like uh, gradually um, uh, over 20 generations um, shows a 0.9 difference in allele frequency. Um, and, you know, like, uh, and we can estimate the selection coefficient to be 0.35, which is extremely high. And in this case, there's practically no change, you know, in the control line. If we dig deep down into this one megabase region, um, what we see is actually um, um, a very um, strong shift in allele frequency as indicated by this plateau here. And if you look at the genetic neighborhood, again, focusing on the TAD, um, you see about three genes in this region. There are no coding changes. And in fact, you know, like um, NK3.2 itself uh, is a known negative regulator of, uh, of bone maturation, but it's not a gene that a classical geneticist would have picked out, you know, of a bag uh, or out of a lineup to knock out, partly because, um, or, or to indicate as a candidate, because um, if this gene itself was knocked out, NK3.2, in fact, you know, the limbs are normal. Um, so it's not a, a priori candidate. And Joao, my PhD student, in fact, you know, like started thinking about, you know, Sonic or Glee 3 or some other candidate genes instead. Now, we can also now uh, use a number of functional genomics approaches by borrowing data from ENCODE and also generating our own open chromatin or TechSeq data to help us identify the, um, the enhancers um, that will be in this region because now it's likely that it's uh, of a regulatory mechanism. And in fact, we can tie also um, these enhancers to the promoter uh, through chromosome, uh, chromosome contact maps, uh, also called 4 seq methodologies. And so with these, we were then very quickly able to uh, hone in to seven enhancers, only three of which carry any SNPs that differ between the founders and the selector lines. And therefore, we can now focus on these three enhancers, which carry a total of um, six or seven SNPs um, in them. So in this case, what we can then do is to take this enhancer and put them in the mouse and basically ask um, whether the mouse um, in the presence of this, um, of this piece of um, DNA would then be able to drive the expression of uh, reported transgene expression like let Z um, at the right place and right time during development. And specifically uh, in this case, we're not just interested in whether this encodes for an enhancer element, but rather whether there is any functional differences if you were to swap out um, from the original variant to the selected one. And so whether, you know, like these different enhancer variants and enhancer alleles actually, uh, you know, have different functional consequences. So in this case, uh, if we were to do that experiment, what would happen uh, is that um, the N1 enhancer drives quite nicely um, limb bud expression. And you can see here actually the expression of leg Z um, in the condensating um, area for future bone formation. And N3 enhancer also drives expression in the limb bud, but also quite a bit more dispersed in the trunk. Now, if you were to swap the three SNPs that we mentioned are different between the selected and the original alleles in the enhancers, what you now get instead are two dead enhancers. So it completely removes the enhancer function. And in fact, we can dig even deeper into this and find that actually out of the three SNPs for the N3 enhancers, two of them sit on a uh, predicted transcription factor binding site, suggesting that in this case, um, this is an abrogation of an autofeedback loop and therefore leading to lower expression of um, this negative bone regulator. So overall, what we think is going on here is that um, the low expression of NK32 leads to the derepression at the growth plate and therefore leading to overall longer tibia. And so selection is acting on two different loss of function uh, enhancer variants in this case. So you may ask, you know, what about differences across species? And that's also a question that uh, Joao was very interested in. So um, he then took um, the corresponding uh, autholog autologous enhancers, in this case from um, different rodents that feature different kinds of locomot uh, locomotory modes. So from jumping, hopping mice to uh, crawling ones here on the right side. And then he did exactly the same as by putting them into the mouse 
um, and then driving expression. So what you see here uh, is that these are also enhancers that encode for different strengths of activity. Now, most important thing here is that these transgenic report assay are, uh, are only semi-quantitative. So um, you should not be looking at the intensity of these um, of these staining, but rather actually at the domain of staining. And you can, in this case, you can see that you know there is a negative, roughly um, negative correlation uh, of the size of the Alexa staining with um, the length of um, the limb but in this case. And in this particular case, actually, um, the particular embryos were looking a bit iffy. And if, if, if you look hard at it, and uh, we're still working on increasing the sample size for this, you can see that there's actually uh, potentially also some promising correlation here for the naked mole red. OK, so um, I have now, um, to sum up this particular section, what I've shown you um, that we have learned from the long chain selection experiments on this question is that um, selection response is highly polygenic. And, uh, but nonetheless, it still involves some of these discrete loci, only a small fraction of which, two of them, are actually responding in parallel. So most of the time when we focus a lot on parallel loci, in fact, you know, like these represent perhaps, you know, very important, the tip of the iceberg kind of scenarios. We found out that actually uh, for rapid selection response, um, sending genetic variant is very important. And these correspond to natural variations. Um, and this is actually uh, really relevant because, you know, under the current climate uh, of rapid environmental changes, um, genetic diversity in some sense is actually many, uh, in many ways, the first line of defense of natural populations, you know, because it, effectively in the long chance experiment, we're dealing with a really rapid drastic change in the selection regime. And that's exactly, you know, the kind of thing that many populations are facing these days. Now, in terms of you know whether uh, is a known gene, uh, well, you know, uh, in this case, NK is three two is a second order sort of you know what I would call a Cinderella gene. In that, you know, it's not a classical developmental regulated gene that everybody would be talking or suspecting. Um, but rather, and and you know, you wouldn't put, pick it out uh, out of a lineup um, in that sense. On the other hand, it has been shown you know to have gene function that is relevant to the trait, and that's why perhaps it get picked up by selection. Um, and this is actually, you know, available as standard genetic variation involving the, um, the gene network, so to speak. We also find RSPO2 again in this, um, in this case. And in fact, you know, there has been examples of RSPO2 also in dogs and also in sticklebacks, um, suggesting that, you know, um, when it comes down to evolutionary changes, there may be some genes that somehow are particularly relevant. And those may not be of the same type that you will find in the classical knockout study. When it comes down to you know the kind of changes between coding versus uh, or, or structural versus regulatory changes, in fact you know both the focal study that I showed you and NK32, but also a genome-wide analysis shows that predominantly the um, genomic response to selection is really is regulatory in nature, and um, and. In terms of larger small effect, you know, in a way, actually, it's a bit of a wash in that, you know, like most of the genome is actually responding in a highly polygenic way, so extremely small effects, so to speak. But the largest loci, um, after some modeling done by Nick, can also account for you know at least ten percent of the selection response, and that's actually quite large, right? So these are you know uh, in you know it's not minor at all to have 0.35 selection coefficient and ten percent of the fitness in this you know derived case. So um, we are talking about actually um, you know some of the large changes that can actually drive rapid evolutionary change. One thing that's really gratifying is that actually very recently um, this paper um, that we you know um, that we've done uh, was picked out to be one of thirteen papers highlighted um, uh, in the collection of, uh, of papers representative papers on quantitative genetics by eLife, and again you know that's really thanks to you know this great collaboration and coming together between uh, Campbell uh, and also Nick you know, who who uh, help us on the theory side of things. Okay, so that's our second section, and you know I show you you know um, how we can actually try to catch evolution in action, and in this case showcase some of the major themes in evolutionary theory. In that it depends on natural variation, the selection acts in a deterministic, you know, directional way, and you know like through the real big struggle for survival. In this case, only ten percent of the mice get to breed. Um, you can actually now have this kind of selection response. Um, this also continues on a theme that we've compiled over time, you know, like this very hard, difficult experimental evolution kind of work, um, or, you know, artificial selection, um, you know, um, um, takes a lot of hard work to do. And um, here, I'm, you know, in the interest of time, I'm not going to, you know, go into some of the details of the other results that we've found. But overall, by looking across different examples, we're starting to compile, you know, some general themes and, um, and um, to understand some of these selection dynamics. 
So in the last section, I'm going to tell you about um, so-called impossible hybrids. Um, this is actually uh, uh, work that we've done um, on um, in the specific hybrid crosses. Like I mentioned before, you know, Darwin himself is very interested in hybrids um, but, uh, and especially looking at uh, hybrid sterility and also incompatibility. I would also like to point out that at our institute, we have a lot of interesting work done also using hybrids, both uh, in zebrafish, but also, you know, like uh, in hybrid necrosis, in this case, in Arabidopsis. Um, and I want to actually discuss in particular um, this case um, that was shown by Uwe uh, a few weeks ago, um, in that they, you know, like make F1 crosses between different Daniel species and uh, was able to actually, you know, see these uh, very interesting, uh, you know, sometimes almost counterintuitive, um, you know, changes in the strike pattern. And this is really beautiful and very nice, partly because, you know, here in F1, you're really bringing the two genomes together and allowing all the gene functions to be competing with each other in order to create this kind of, uh, of trait. And this may not be something that you expect, you know, if you were to look at, you know, um, the gene function in, uh, a priori. But I will also argue here that if you could actually push it beyond F1 generation and really start reshuffling the genome, you might, you know, very well find more interesting, potentially even find the particular genes uh, or genes that are actually controlling this trait, you know, like so that you can actually have a horizontal stripe, for example, versus, you know, like um, the other variant. Now, some of you who are actually maybe working more with proteins um, may think, you know, why, why not just substitute a single gene or, you know, drive heterologous expression in the protein complex, for example. And there are examples um, of this type of work, let's say, you know, like uh, uh, mentioned by Hamid uh, Malik a few weeks ago, uh, by you know, introducing a human version, uh, humanized PRDM9 into the mouse um, to sort of circumvent hybrid sterility. Now, um, here it takes a lot of um, very smart guesswork for finding the right candidate gene. It doesn't always work. And for the most part, you know, in this case, you know, what you're testing are really actually um, the structural changes. So, you know, it works quite well for a lot of these coding changes. And even if it were to function in those cases, in some sense, you know, it's still unclear um, uh, whether the gene itself is truly relevant. Because in some sense, taking the gene out of context is almost a little bit like, you know, running an Android app, you know, on an iPhone, in that, you know, like, um, there are all kinds of interactions that you are missing in those cases. So my argument is that if you really want to look at what genes matter for evolution, there's really no substitute in many cases for you know, allowing whole genome to interact with each other for full interaction. So the situation in mouse is the following in that you know, even between quite closely related um, um, sister species, they also exhibit hybrid sterility. So in this case, we're looking at the lab mouse strain mostly in the moose domesticus crossed with spray tooth and they exhibit hybrid sterility in the male, uh, how things rule, females are actually iffy. Um, and so, you know, our ELC funded uh, hybrid mix project effectively is asking one of these fundamental questions in that, well, what if we just forget about development and focus on the germline? So, you know, in this case, if we can mix up the germline and mix up and shuffle the genome, can we eventually end up doing um, genetic mapping, you know, without actually having to deal with, you know, the organism itself, with the, with the, um, with the body itself? Now, John and Susanna and other people who study, you know, like meiosis and, um, and chrom um, sex evolution, sex chromosome evolution can tell you that um, the magic happens, you know, like during meiosis um, in that there is the pairing and recombination that happens such that you end up getting, you know, um, haploid gametes with recombined um, chromosomes. And in contrast, for mitosis, there's about 500 million years of evolutionary pressure to make sure they have faithful replication of the um, chromosomes and create diploid and unrecombined chromosomes. Now, one of these genes uh, called Bloom um, helicase, um, um, if you were to suppress the gene function, um, it acts um, in, during my, both mitosis and meiosis in resolving double strand breaks and actually uh, um, resolving a lot of these uh, particular problems. So it's known to be a bit of a guardian of a genome. And if you were to suppress the gene function, it leads to sometimes uh, improper sister chromatase change during mitosis. And every now and then, in fact, you know, you can actually get um, the uh, mitotic recombination between homologous chromosomes. Um, and so in that case, you end up having a situation where you have mitosis, but then you have recombined um, uh, chromosomes in the daughter cells. So in that way, it sort of provides a way for us to actually shuffle up the genome and recombine it. And then, you know, uh, in that sense, uh, the magic could potentially happen in that you can do genetic mapping using this in vitro recombination approach.
So I mentioned to you earlier that hybrid sterility arises quite early uh, in mouse. On the other hand, F1 hybrids are possible and viable uh, for quite a long range of, um, of um, divergences. And here I'm showing you an example from 1977, a so-called F1 hybrid mouse mule uh, formed between um, Moose musculus and uh, Moose caroli that together span about um, 6 million years of divergence. And uh, with collaborators, we are then able to collect a set of F1 hybrid embryonic stem cells that span one, two, and 60 million years of divergence. Um, and um, by suppressing the function of uh, bloom, we can also show that actually you can uh, induce recombination. In this case, this is shown by um, changes and variegation in the GFA expression um, in this colony of stem cells. So um, what about mapping traits? So I'm going to show you examples from uh, uh, um, a 6TG uh, theoguanine drug, but also um, in looking at uh, stemness in this case, uh, in single cell assays. So the way it works is that we'll create um, in vitro recombination, and then we'll put it through a fact sorter uh, and phenotyping in this case at a single cell level. And uh, by adding this drug, effectively it uh, is metabolized by HPRT into a cytotoxic compound. And as a result, it will kill the cell. And so if you add DAPI and um, your cell membrane is not intact, then DAPI can go in quickly. And so this population would indicate the cells that are dead and this population alive. And effectively what we have here is, um, can either be known as a bulk second assay or genome-wide case control association study in that sense, in a population of cells. And so when you now sequence um, the, the cell populations from these two gates, what you get is that across the genome, across the autosomes, there's actually practically not a lot of difference between um, the, um, between the um, life and death cells, indicating that these regions are not relevant to um, the survival uh, under 6TG treatment. But if you actually look at um, the chromosome X where HPRT lives, what you see is that there's a huge excess of spraytus alleles in this case, indicating that the spraytus alleles is uh, encoding for a higher susceptibility to 6TG, 6TG treatment. And in this case, this makes sense because um, there was papers in the 80s showing that the spraytus allele HPRT gene is 50 to 100 times more active and therefore they tend to actually then lead to cells that may die. And uh, we were able to replicate this result also uh, after only about five days of, um, of um, ML216 um, suppression with the whole experiment lasting for six days. And so in some sense, this is really rapid genetic mapping without actually using any live mouse at all. And if you were to do this in yeast, uh, you might still take a week you know, to induce uh, meiosis. If you were to calculate the number of um, cell doublings and generation time, um, this would have taken, you know, like uh, five generations or 450 days, you know, if you can sell the mouse, which you can't. Okay, so another cellular phenotype we looked at is, um, is early differentiation. So in this case, um, we can actually, um, because stem cell actually require cues uh, for self-renewal. And so if you were to withdraw these cues over three days, you know, they start becoming more iffy and start looking something like this. And so this is work done by INSA and FOCA. And um, this is uh, an earlier attempt at um, um, single cell transcriptome. And so we use the commercial platform 10X Genomics by putting the cells into individual micro droplets. And then um, they would attach, you know, cellular barcodes um, onto a poly A uh, transcript. And then you can pull the whole samples with the cellular barcodes and sequence in one go. And so what you're looking at here is about 9,000 cells, you know, expressed in the cell uh, in the gene expression space. With each one of these dots representing one cell, and if they're closer to each other, they, sh they share a more similar expression profile. What you can see is that uh, across the two different um, STEMI treatments, they are very, very robust, and you know, like um, they share very similar uh, profiles. But then you also can see a differentiation axis in that with the withdrawal of the 2i and lift treatment, um, they tend to now you know, drive expression down this way. And if you were to compare the gene expression, you see a lot of downregulation of the key Yamanaka factors like KR4 and NANOC, for example, and also some surprising ones like BRCA2. Um, and these are more downstream lineage um, um, specific genes and methylation genes. Okay, what about IVR? So in this case, you know, like um, this is the original standard uh, treatment. And under the recombining treatment uh, and with full withdrawal or two I and lift, we actually recapitulate the entire um, range of, um, of um, cell expression. And we are, are dealing with about 20,000 uh, cells in this case. So there's an expansion of the space. And in fact, we're interested in looking whether we can perform genetic mapping with it. 
And both NANOG and OX6, so one of the interactive uh, marker expressions show that you know, it's preserving the same uh, differentiation axis. So here we basically have a phenotype that allow us to do genetic mapping with about 20,000 cells. So um, I'm going to try to convince you that actually in the RNA-seq data, nonetheless, you can try to call genotype. So this is a non-recombining cells and you can see um, uh, alleles and variants uh, along the genome that uh, correspond to one of the two parents uh, on chromosome 13. So in this non-recombining cells, you will have a heterozygous or yellow genotype. But then, you know, in recombining cells, what you can now get are, um, you know, like the flips that indicate that, you know, you actually have a, a, a genetic recombination. And across many cells, we actually have now sufficient number of genetic recombination to allow us to do perform genetic mapping, but also build genetic map. And you know, it may look some, something like this in a standard genetic map here between you know, lab strains. Each chromosome covers about 100 centimorgan in length. And under normal mitotic uh, conditions, you actually have a great reduction in uh, the genetic length. But under in vitro recombination, uh, bloom suppression treatment, um, you actually have a six-fold expansion of the, um, of the genetic length sufficient uh, for us to do genetic mapping. So effectively, even though you know, like the mitotic map length is about one sixth the length of um, the my, uh, mitotic one is one sixth that of the meiotic one. Nonetheless, this is actually providing enough um, genetic resolution, perhaps you know, for us to do some of the early mapping. And what you're looking at also, in some sense, is the very first mitotic genetic map. We also see something quite interesting here. For example, these are some of the uh, mitotic recombination hotspots. And we're still looking at the underlying, you know, um, sequence. Perhaps it's repetitive region, etc. You know, that actually lead to these uh, these high uh, prevalence of mitotic recombination. Okay, so in this case, you know, we use the differentiation phenotype. We use the genotype that we call from the transcript, and this is the mapping result. So overall, across the different um, autosomes, we can actually now find three significant genome significant QTLs. And some of which actually, um, you know, for example, the one here on chromosome 13, I encode for a cyclin gene, which makes sense in controlling cell cycle and is related to, um, to stemless maintenance, but also actually along, uh, along non-coding RNA um, that were knocked out also uh, led to um, strains losing pluripotency. And specifically in this case, turns out the black six, the lab strain allele is uh, driving differentiation. And if you now look at this other locus, uh, which likely is controlled by a ring finger protein, you actually see that there is uh, the spray dose allele in this case is associated with increased stemness. So in this hybrid mix section, I've told you that, you know, like these mouse hybrids are sterile, but viable. We can use hybrid ESLs cells to actually study, you know, differences between species, um, but also actually to bypass the species barriers without involving live mice. Um, and we do this by um, bloom suppression. It boosts recombination and also enables genetic mapping. You have seen perhaps, you know, the very first mitotic genetic map. And we are also now looking at the very interesting phenomena of these mitotic recombination hotspots. Um, perhaps they're associated with some genetic features and thing one in the lab, you know, like looking at G4, for example, um, that may be relevant. And um, here we also um, show you hopefully, you know, like um, the ability to combine IVR with single cell approaches. And in the future, in fact, you know, FOCA, um, the graduate student in the lab is working on combining uh, transcriptome with uh, ataxic, for example, to uh, really drive um, this approach. So, you know, there are also other nice features about these IVR uh, things. In particular, if you can actually keep a line, um, you can now actually uh, subject it to many different treatments. And it's got many nice features. And through some heroic efforts by both uh, INSA, but also MIN in the lab, we have now generated a large panel of recombinant inbred material that otherwise uh, would be very difficult to get uh, in live mice. In many sense, you know, we're also doing a lot of tissue engineering to try to, you know, like use the developmental biology paradigm to drive from one single genome into many different cell fates. I'm not going to go through, you know, like um, a lot of those, but basically suffices to say that, you know, like we are getting some uh, interesting early nice results, um, both in cardiomyocyte, but also in driving differentiation of, um, of T cells. And Mohead in the lab is particularly interested in looking at the T cell receptor repertoire, for example, from different um, species. This is um, sort of a bit of a fun result that, you know, like nonetheless is still nice to show in that, you know, ultimately we're interested in organismal phenotype. And overall, you can see from some of the CT scans that they actually can show very distinct different uh, phenotypes. And we team up with our collaborator in Treston to actually derive a whole mouse from our IVR ES cells. And this is actually what we jokingly call in the lab an impossible hybrid mouse uh, that is basically an advanced um, mosaic recombinant uh, genome. 
And um, this particular mouse actually looks quite normal with this development. Um, and you know, we can actually now segment and look at the different organs, for example, uh, and measure the, the shape and sizes of those. The second uh, embryo, um, also IVR, um, doesn't require uh, an expert development biologist to tell you that it's missing its head. And, um, and in this case, you know, we think actually there are more of these neural tube, tube uh, fusion defects and um, it might be actually due to problems in cell-cell communication, for example. Okay, so, um, but that is a bit um, small scale. And so, you know, what INSA in the lab is doing right now is actually going to using gastro as a method um, to actually start, now start to drive differentiation. She manages to do this in a couple of lines, including actually one of these F1 hybrid lines. And right now we're looking to apply this uh, in, um, in um, across many of these IVR lines so that we can potentially map and apply the single cell RNA attack um, so-called share seek method to you know like look at the cellular phenotypes. So in the last 45, 50 minutes, I've shown you, you know, like um, various different results we have um, done over uh, the years to really try to get at the question of um, you know how the genome evolves and you know the genetic basis of this change. And I want to um, just zoom out here and point out that, you know, like um, we do this kind of study not because it's, um, it's easy, but because we think it's really relevant and important to help us answer the question and connect genotype to phenotype and understand that in the context of selection. Some of the main themes that we find out is that oftentimes, you know, response to selection is polygenic. Um, that, you know, like the men, you know, the problem isn't so much finding variation. There are so many variation around. The problem actually is finding the adaptive variation that may be rare, but, you know, nonetheless is driving the selection response. And if you don't catch it quickly and don't catch it right afterwards, it might get swamped out by, you know, neutral variants that accumulate afterwards. A lot of times, you know, like um, the changes tend to be regulatory and in some sense, you know, really requires us thinking about, you know, uh, genetic variation in a new way that, you know, it um, we have to go beyond, you know, just uh, CRISPR screens or, you know, uh, knockouts or, you know, GWAS within standing variation uh, populations, because oftentimes, you know, they may be missing what is really important there. So the future in that, in that sense, you know, will be involving a lot of big data. You involve actually, you know, more of the selection experiments where you can capture dynamics, but it also involves thinking broadly and deeply to dive into molecular mechanisms. For example, you know, many of these functional genomics approach uh, approaches that we're developing and adopting, you know, like to really look at how the individual mutations can lead to changes, you know, in the genome. And we're also developing a lot of these, you know, new algorithms to take advantage of these new data. Um, and so the last thing I'll leave you guys with is that, you know, many of you may have noticed that, you know, I have not talked at all about haplotagging. It's not because we're not excited about it. In, in fact, we think it's uh, the future uh, for a lot of genome sequencing that will make it cheaper, faster, and give you, you know, higher quality results. Um, this has allowed us to actually study a very interesting case of hybridization in butterflies, uh, and also actually appeared just this Wednesday uh, with a new um, rapid genotyping algorithm um, in nature genetics. Uh, with us. Um, and in fact, it drives the, um, the uh, Darwin Tree of Life project at the Sanger Institute. And right now we're talking to Illumina uh, to actually see whether they will be interested in providing official support. But this is really much, you know, the kind of thing that would uh, go towards driving, giving us the data and, you know, help think to shape some new thinking and new algorithm in, you know, how we can approach the future, which is where data science really meets, you know, development in that sense. So with that, I'd like to thank many, many people in the lab, uh, in particular, a special shout out for, uh, for Matic, uh, but also Insa, who has led you know, some of the most um, grueling um, uh, tissue culture work in the uh, Hypermix project. Uh, our collaborators and friends you know, um, uh, on this campus, in particular, you know, without you guys, I don't know how we can pull through this uh, pandemic. Uh, my collaborators at many different places um, who made this work all possible and also the funding sources. With that, I'd like to take any questions you may have. Um, hello, can I ask a question? Oh. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. It was a really nice talk. And especially I'm waiting for this uh, single cell uh, RNA-seq uh, 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 typing, uh, half type, sorry, not, not half typing, but yeah. <laughs> So the, my question was uh, about the Faro mice uh, subject. Mm -hmm. So um, you said that for this skull phenotype, 
there is this uh, wind activator that came out and it is, uh, as you described it as Cinderella gene that was uh, known to be important, but uh, not a big deal at this moment, uh, up to this moment. Uh, I was thinking, uh, what if um, you look into a more of a global gene regulatory network approach? Uh, in that sense, uh, would you say that in this more global gene regulatory network approach, uh, this will be more uh, explainable? Ah, right. Um, here, there are three major concepts um, that I think uh, will be very important to um, discuss and to dissect a little bit. So you basically ask, okay, if we were to measure, not just, you know, not look at the Canada genes in terms of knockout phenotype, but rather look at um, the overall transcriptome and the connectedness between them. So gene regulatory networks. Um, whether that would actually give you uh, a closer um, you know, shot on go effectively, you know, a, a, a closer clue to what might be relevant genes. Um, the first thing I want to mention is that gene regulatory network um, also needs to be understood in terms of its dynamics and tweaks. So when people do genetic, uh, when people do um, a microarray, for example, or RNA-seq, you know, you look at uh, the integration of the gene effects and, you know, with gene expression level, when, and we assume that the genes that are more highly expressed may be more relevant for particular um, you know, downstream trait, right? Um, but in some sense, we are basically looking at um, the underlying wiring and not so much the tweaks and variation um, on it. So for example, if you were to have a genetic variant um, transcription factor, let's say, it changes a very tiny little bit in terms of the gene expression level, right? But it has a lot of huge downstream effects. So if you just look at the largest changes, expression divergences between humans and chimps, for example, you will find the things that are downstream, but you may not find actually the genetic variant itself that draw, that you know sort of kicks off this whole chain of events, right? So in that sense, it helps, um, but it is still potentially not exactly um, always cluing you in onto the genes that would be relevant. So. The three things I want to dis uh, distinguish is between people doing knockouts, where they basically are wanting to look at the underlying wiring, the genetic, um, the, the architecture of the organism, so to speak. And then people look at gene networks, in some of the case, these connected as um, uh, under normal wild type scenario. And what I'm asking is people, please also think about tweaking it. You know, like in these tweaking scenarios, then you might actually see some of the largest changes that might otherwise look innocuous in a, uh, RNA seq study, but actually would be relevant. And to look to get at these, you might have to look at um, populations that have undergone adaptation. You might have to look at selection experiments. You might be, have to work. You might have to work hard to find the right context. But those right contexts are worth it because that's what you know the kind of variant that may drive evolutionary change. Thank you very much. Right, there's a question in the chat whether the mitotic recombination hotspot overlap with meiotic hotspots. Um, we have some earlier results from a different context uh, on the X chromosome where they may have some similarity. Uh, and that was because in one case, we were able to track it to something that looks like a cemental duplication. But so far, we are not seeing all the same places. Um, in talking to Hamid Malik, for example, he was asking, you know, well, are those associated with repetitive elements, alus, for example, or, you know, um, in the mouse, uh, uh, you know, would be, would be the retro elements, uh, or whether, you know, actually may lead to, you know, like differences in organization of, um, you know, fragile sites or, you know, chromosome, um, you know, openness and other things. Um, and, you know, that fragile site, for example, was something that Felicity uh, thought that might be relevant. So we're looking into those, um, but overall they do not overlap really strongly right now. Um, and um, something entirely different might be going on. We don't know yet, stay tuned. Other questions? Hey Frank, a nice talk. I, I just asked a question in chat, but nobody's asking, so I will ask one more. So sure. how surprised you were uh, when you saw that these two different um, 
experiments or on the long shank experiment uh, you had like two repetitions your collaborator had two repetitions mm -hmm. how surprised you were that uh, you didn't see a lot of genetic drift uh, because they they mostly were going um, on the diagonal right um, they were not going um, on their own axis so were you surprised or you guys were expecting this Right. So um, let me clarify a little bit that result. Um, so what you're talking about is um, is the plot where, uh, let me see if I can go there. There you go, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, what you were saying was that they, um, um, the image itself might be um, driving an impression that is more than, um, more than what it looks, looks like. Large loci tend to have really strong hitchhiking. So it drags along a whole bunch of regions. And here actually, you know, if you count the number of loci, we count two that, that are strictly speaking parallel. There may be one other thing here. I think it might be hitchhiking on that. So, um, so um, the overall signal actually, if anything, if you were to count, depending on how you look at it, um, if you're counting um, the, number of loci that show clear signature of parallelism, they are very rare. But if you look at the total amount of selection response explainable by each locus, then the parallelism is quite important because they're actually some of the top ranked loci. So they account for the mo most of the selection response in that, yeah, sorry, more bigger selection response. It's not most, it's not more than half, but you know, like uh, quite a large fraction of it. And later, um, uh, Graham Coop and other people uh, have been developing some polygenic selection uh, approaches, and they looked at the correlation between uh, alleles uh, as a way to indicate in a polygenic sense whether there's parallelism. And they saw actually in this long shanks data, quite a strong signal that suggests that also uh, un even under polygenic scenario, but very minor slight shift in allele frequency. So you will not be able to detect it using selective sweep analysis, for example. They were able to see that there was also reasonable contribution of parallelism. So um, as a, a lot of things in biology is a little bit off the above, um, but ahead of time, if you were to ask me to pick out of a bag, uh, any given adaptive locus that may be responding, I will tell you the chances are those will be independent ones. If I just randomly pick one. Frank, can I ask one more question? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this time my question is about the in vitro recombination uh, and also the surprising uh, findings for the mice that came out of it. Uh, because mitosis in general is quite conservative to epigenetic changes. Uh, however, this induced uh, mitosis in, sorry, meiosis in the mitotic cycle uh, is, I, I don't know if it is known how uh, it affects the epigenome. Uh, have you considered checking it? And would that be a potential source of this variation between the two, two mice, the headless one and the one with a head. So my first thought, um, so um, let's put, ad, ad, address this question from several ways. Um, the main question is basically whether these uh, um, treatment would really drastically change, you know, how the cells are functional. And um, here we're looking at F1 hybrid cells. Um, the caveat being that we have Black six, so lab strain, pure ES cells. We have, um, but we don't have the pure um, spray tools one because actually those are very difficult to derive. Um, so we, you know, only have the focal uh, comparison here. Formally, your question: If you can actually compare between the black six pure and spray tools pure, then you can establish the space that they change it and basically ask, you know, despite this treatment, does it stay within the same space? We don't have that, but. Within the context of the F1 um, expression space, what you saw in that cloud is that it doesn't just completely go in a different direction, right? So after the IVR treatment, um, they do not completely go into outer spaces, so to speak, you know, in expression. So I would say that that would be one data point towards suggesting that they're not completely crazy. 
right? And um, the other thing is also that the genes that we pick out, you know, do make sense. So it's not as though, you know, the genes, you know, like are completely random, you know, et cetera. So um, I think in this case, um, there is enough genetic variation and our treatment did not completely create, you know, like a, a Franken ESL that uh, seems that, you know, what we are finding uh, should be relevant. Yeah. But it, but it's, it is uh, relevant and interesting. And I guess, you know, when we start having more of these single cell attack and RNA uh, assays, we will actually be able to dig into this quite a bit deeper. I would mention that one thing that we're currently doing in collaboration with David Kingsley at Stanford is that um, we're actually looking at um, some allotetraploid, um, so cell fusion between human and chimp ES cells. So these are actually cells that carry four copies of a genome from very distinct origin. And uh, that would be quite an interesting, you know, question in those cases to see, you know, like uh, how that changes, you know, with uh, in vitro recombination changes their expression space and focus doing uh, share seek on those ones. Thank you. Okay, so um, are there any other burning questions? If not, you guys would also know where to find me. And um, thank you guys for attending talk. And I hope um, this will spare a lot of conversations and collaborations, et cetera. Thank you.